Good evening, everybody, and welcome all of you to this live program at Orthopedic Principles. Today, our guest of honor is Dr. Baljinda Dinsa from London, United Kingdom. Dr. Dinsa is a fellowship trained consultant orthopedic surgeon specializing in treatment of foot and ankle conditions. He currently works in Kent as well as London in the United Kingdom. After his undergraduate degree from Guy's, King's, and St. Thomas Medical School, he completed trauma and orthopedic high surgical training on the Southeast Thames rotation. During this training, he held the role of academy doctor at the Charlton Athletic Football Club, which provided him with the experience of managing sports players. To further his foot and ankle training and to learn the latest advances in techniques, he completed a British orthopedic foot and ankle surgery approved fellowship at the Guy's and St. Thomas Hospital in Malawi. He's also taken part in a visiting fellowship with Professor Hinterman in Basel, Switzerland. So today, it's my great honor to introduce you to Dr. Baljinda Dinsa from the United Kingdom. Over to you, Bal. Uh, thank you, Tesh, and thank you for inviting me to do this talk. I uh, hope it's informative, and I'm aiming this at the level of uh, FRCS exam, and we're looking at concentrating on the pediatric flat feet and claw toes in the adults. Just a bit of background about myself. I work at William Harvey Hospital in Kent, but also work in London. And uh, my subspeciality is uh, foot and ankle surgery, as Hitesh uh, mentioned. Uh, of note, I'd like to just mention that we do take a lot, lot of doctors from India. And if anyone wants to come over and visit us, we'd greatly appreciate it. And we'd be, um, I would like your interest, you can get in touch with me. Now, the uh, pes planus is traditionally described as loss of longitudinal arch. But as with most things in the foot and ankle, it's slightly more complex. And there's often a valgus posture of the heel there's a subluxation of the subtalar joint. There's inversion at the calcaneum at the subtalar joint, supination of the forefoot, and sometimes you can have tender Achilles foreshortening, which makes the valgus alignment um, slightly exaggerated as well. So you can, as you can imagine, it's not a simple deformity and there's multiple aspects to it. Now we know that infants are born with flat feet and it's normally uh, up until the age of seven to 10 years before they fully develop a normal arch. And sub studies have shown that at the age of three, up, up to the age of three years, nearly up to 50% of people could have a flat feet. By the time they get to six years of age, it's reduces to about 24%. But the question is how relevant is this? We know that in the adult population, 15 to 20% could have a flexible flat feet and they remain asymptomatic. And studies have shown that the presence and severity of symptoms related, uh, are related to the body mass index, as well as the degree of lateral displacement on the navicular. And this is very important to um, assess when you're taking a history from a patient and when you're examining them as well, as in it's how much is it affecting them and their symptoms more than the clinical deformity or the radiographic findings. Now, when you're taking a history, it's important to, in the pediatric setting, to take a full uh, birth history, whether there's any problems with um, the perinatal period, whether there's any problems with the delivery, as well as their developmental milestones and whether they're meeting this uh, the expected pace. It's also important to take a family history to see if there is a history of uh, any lower limb deformity issues and particularly uh, flat feet. In the slightly older patients, uh, so when you're talking about six years plus, it's, it's important to get an idea of their sporting activities and how uh, this is getting affected by their alignment of their foot and whether this is stopping them from doing things. And particularly, it may affect their biomechanics when they're running. And so it's important to see if this is having an impact on their knees and their hips as well. Now, it's difficult examining a child, depending, especially when they're younger and less than three years of age. You have to follow the usual orthopedic principles of look, feel, move. And I'm not going to go over this with you at the moment. I think the pertinent points are to see if the foot is flexible. And most uh, pes planus in children are uh, flexible deformity. And so when you put them in an unweight bearing posture, there should be some reconstitution of a normal arch. Another way to assess this is ask them to tiptoe walk. And once again, you should see reconstitution of this arch. And these are key points to determine whether this is a flexible or not a flexible deformity. If an, accept if an acceptable longitudinal arch is not reconstituted with non-weight bearing or tiptoe walking, then we need to consider that this may be a fixed or rigid deformity. Now, radiographs, they can be quite confusing in uh, the uh, paediatric setting. Uh, 
at the standard radiographs, we get are the weight bearing AP or dorsal planar and lateral views. And we also get oblique views as well. And with what we're looking for on this is on the lateral view, we're looking at the degree of a Taylor plantar flexion, and particularly Miri's angle. And we also see if there's any midfoot break. And this can sometimes happen at the navicular cuneiform level or also at the first tarsal metatarsal level. On the dorsal planar view, we're looking at the Taylor cocanial divergence to see the degree of um, deformity, as well as looking to see the amount of Taylor head uncovering. But once again, this can be difficult to see in the very early years. The oblique view is of uh, use to see to see if there's a uh, cocanial navicular coalition. But obviously, this would be later on in life, and this would be the ones at around nine to fourteen years of age. I don't think there's much of a role with regards to MRI or a CT in this age group for uh, plantar valgus. Now, when we look at uh, management options, we look at operative and non-operative measures. Obviously, we we'll start off with the non-operative measures, as we should always do so. And there's a, there is a role for orthotics, and this is to protect the medial arch, also protect the tibialis posterior tendon from, from uh, allowing it to rest and also recover, not overstretching it and stopping progression. And if it's a slightly longer one, it can, uh, which includes the heel, you can have a sort of posting to help keep the heel in neutral and avoid getting into too much valgus. However, I think the role of this has to be guarded. I think from children from walking age to three years of age, there's no real role for this, for, especially for expensive orthosis. And this is really for the slightly older patient. However, you should consider it as a fairly important um, um, avenue of treatment if there's a family history of persistent flat foot going to adulthood. And therefore, you should consider this at an earlier stage in these patients. It's important also when you're using this to explain to the patients that it may be uncomfortable initially and it's a matter of weaning into the orthotic. So getting a new orthotic and wearing it for 12 hours a day will do no good because the patient will get fed up with it because of the pain and discomfort it causes and will stop using it. It's important to use it for a short period of time and build this period of time up every day until it becomes comfortable. And then you'll get the long-term benefits from it as well. There has been suggestion of uh, muscle training and strengthening, particularly of the intrinsics. In the pediatric population, this, there hasn't been any suggestion or results to say that this is a, um, an avenue that should go forward. It's more about gen general stretching of the whole uh, foot and ankle to keep it mobile. And then if the patient has persistent pain, is not getting better, it's, they're stopping them from doing activities and they're stopping them from having a normal uh, childhood, we consider the surgical options. And certainly in this population where it's a fairly flexible deformity. We wouldn't want to consider arthrodesis or any type of procedures like that. And we would certainly would want to do joint preserving surgery. And the mainstay would be a calcaneal osteotomy. And uh, th this would involve a triplanar type uh, correction. When the transverse plane, we are trying to raise the floor of the sinus tarsi. In the oblique plane through the tuberosity, we're trying to shift the posterior fragment of the calcaneus medially to improve the weight bearing axis of the calcaneus. In a coronal plane, we're making the osteotomy just posterior to the cranial cuboid joint to lengthen the lateral column on the foot and therefore correcting the forefoot abduction. And the picture on the left-hand side here demonstrates this. You can use a tricord graft to help with this osteotomy or you can use a, also use a step-type plate with a wedge. Um, in the pediatric po uh, population, often it's better to use a tricortical wedge because it reduces the need for uh, metal work and potential joint penetration as well. There has been a, a recent trend towards using arthroresis screw, and this is a screw that's placed through the sinus tarsi through a small incision, and it tries to correct the deformity in a similar pattern to what I've described above, but without any osteotomies. Uh, once again, there's been very short-term results. There's been no long-term data to suggest the outcome of this, but the people that do do it are suggesting some good results, uh, particularly some of the foot and ankle surgeons in Australia. But once again, without the long-term results, this is something just to keep an eye on, that it is an option in some settings. Uh, the main risk of arthroesis screw from the, uh, uh, from the data is that it can overstuff the sinus tarsi and make it rigid. However, I've been told and also read that it's quite easy to remove this and therefore this complication therefore has a limited impact. And then we move on to the rigid flat feet, which is the, 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 the flat feet that is of a real concern. Because once again, as I said, a lot of flexible flat feet are asymptomatic. 
it, and most of them can be managed without um, uh, surgical intervention. Uh, the rigid flat free are a different entity entirely. And uh, tarsal coalition comes up there quite highly. And then you have the congenital vertical talus, which is certainly less uh, common, and accessory navicular, which uh, often is, remains asymptomatic and therefore is, uh, comes lower down on the, um, uh, on the prevalence. In regards to tarsal coalition, this is a, tends to be a failure of the mes uh, uh, primitive mesocarm to segment and produce normal peritalar joint complex. And the two main tarsal coalitions are the talar cocaineal and the, and the cocaineal navicular, which we'll look at separately. So with the, the um, cocaineal navicular, we know that this is uh, probably present from birth, but as it doesn't ossify until the age of uh, eight to 14 years of age, symptoms remain relatively rare until then. And this is because of the flexibility of the cartilage surrounding the uh, primary ossification center allows a good degree of flexibility and therefore remain relatively asymptomatic up until this stage. It's as the uh, coalition ossifies, the hind foot stiffens and this results in um, a reduced range of motion, inability to withstand stresses of uh, rigorous activity, and also um, difficulty uh, walking on uneven ground. You have several types of coalitions. You have the fibrous and the cartilaginous, which is the incomplete coalitions, and then you had osseous coalitions, difficulty walking on uneven ground. Often in the early stages, due to the, um, uh, uh, due to the flexibility of the soft tissues, often the plane of vagus deformity isn't obvious, and it's, uh, it, it's often the patient complains of repetitive sprains or twists or injuries, or just difficulty when doing activity on a sporting field, is that when it's noticed. And then with the Taylor cocaineal coalitions, these tend to ossify at the age of 12 years of age. And these tend to occur in uh, older patients than those with the co uh, cocaineal uh, navicular coalitions. Once again, similar symptoms of foot fatigue and the loss of the longitudinal arch. But once again, this may be um, not as obvious and certainly the valgus alignment may not be as obvious initially. There may be a marked reduction or complete absence of subtalar motion. And this is where the examination is quite important. And the perineal muscle spasm may be present as a result of the reduced subtalar motion. The perineals tend to um, have an impact to try to maintain stability of the ankle and the foot with, when we're on uneven ground and when uh, toe offing as well. So how do we investigate these patients? Due to the normal variations in the osseous anatomy of the hind foot, radiographic standardization is quite difficult. It's sensible to get the radiographs to look at uh, the alignment, as we mentioned, looking at the um, Miri's angle on the lateral and looking at the titanococaneal coalition, uh, sorry, yeah, titanococaneal angulation. However, it's difficult to see the degree of um, coalition, as well as you can't see the fibrous uh, coalitions on that either. And also you can't um, determine how much of the coalition has taken, particularly with the Taylor cocaineal ones. You, don't not, you want to really know how much of the joint is affected. On the radiographs for Taylor cocaineal, you're particularly looking for beaking of the head of the talus, which you can see on the top right corner. You get a broadening, a rounding of the lateral process of the talus. You get narrowing of the posterior Taylor cocaineal joint space and you get loss of the medial subtalar joint. Once again, this sometimes can be difficult, but I've shown you examples here of quite easy ones to see. And on the bottom right, you can see a cocaineal navicular coalition, and certainly this shows the anteater sign, which is common for this. In the recent years, CT scan has really taken over, particularly with uh, pre-optive planning, and certainly this has helped to, to determine the best course of action, particularly when we want to know how much of the joint is affected by the coalition. And often when it's uh, fibrous or cartilaginous, you get this uneven uh, appearance on the joint surfaces, which is suggestive of this type of coalition. And more recently, the MRI scan sort of taken over from CT scan as well, and it's reduced the uh, uh, risks of radiation as well. 
However, you have to counteract that with the discomfort the patient may feel with MRI, and they may find it slightly more claustrophobic than a CT scan. And it all depends what's available to you in your service. So in regards to coalitions, the first course of management, as always, is a non-operative. And you look at reducing your activities, immobilization, and this can be in a walking boot or it can be in a cast, depending on how sensible you think the patient is and what, what, what is more suitable for the patient. And you can do shoe modifications, such as orthotics as well, to offload certain areas and protect the perineal tendons as well. If these, these uh, um, options fail to uh, manage the um, symptoms, or and the, if the symptoms remain recalcitrant, the two main options surgically are excision of coalition and interposition or arthrodesis type procedures. Now for the telecocanial joint uh, coalitions, you really need to know how much of the joint surface is affected and you need to know whether there's any joint changes being seen. And certainly you'd consider excision of the coalition if there, there's less than 50% of the telecocanial joint surface being involved. I think if it's more than that, the results are quite um, variable and not as um, encouraging. For the cocaine navicular, you can always consider a coalition. I don't think you need to worry about the joint surface involved. And whilst this uh, may not completely resolve uh, the restricted range of motion of biomechanical movements of the subtalar joint, it will improve uh, function and symptoms, and that is key. In the talococanial uh, joint, if it's more than 50% or if there's judential changes, then we are looking at options of either a subtalar fusion or if it's a very rigid hind foot and a large coalition, we may be looking at a triple arthrodesis. Certainly in the setting of the um, cocaineal navicular, if, uh, excision, if an excision of coalition isn't an option and if we are going to arthrodesis, it certainly is nearly always either a double arthrodesis or a triple arthrodesis. And um, that there's no role for isolated arthrodesis in these. Um, as we mentioned, with the telecocanial uh, coalitions, um, you can you often interpose this, you can interpose this with fat, with muscle, or with bone wax. And once again, the outcomes of this are limited and there's no real long-term results, but the short-term results have been encouraging for this, particularly if they're less than 50% of the surface area. Moving on to uh, congenital vertical talus. This is certainly a rare deformity. It can be described as a rock or bottom flat foot or congenital rigid flat foot. Um, it's characteristically uh, described as a fixed, dors uh, fixed dorsal dislocation of the navicular on the head of the talus. It has a rigid equinus associated with it or the contracture of the hind foot. And it also has an associated forefoot abduction and dorsiflexion. And this is often secondary to the contractures of uh, extensor digitorum longus, extensor hallucis longus, and tibialis anterior tendon. And without treatment, and more importantly, without recognition of this condition, this can cause significant deformity and disability with pain and callus formation along the tailor head. And it can make long-term function significantly affected and associated disability and this is where it becomes quite important, given its rarity, to identify it as soon as possible. Its estimated prevalence is about 1 in 10,000 live, birth, live births. And whilst its etiology is not known, it's been associated with neurological and genetic syndromes in up to 50% of cases. It has been associated with arthrogryposis, myelingocil, and genetic profiles that have been associated with trisomy 18 and trisomy 13. The prevalence of one in uh, 10,000 has been suggested, but they also feel that a lack of recognition of disorder may make this an underestimation of the true prevalence. It's often mistaken with a cicanial uh, valgus foot, a posterior medial bowing of the tibia, the oblique talus, and a flexible flat foot. The key differentiator to these is the rigid nature of the congenital vertical talus. It really is not correctable passively um, whilst they're awake. And uh, this is a, the, 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 um, a way to differentiate from the other conditions. As the patient starts to weight bear, 
the tailorbones start adapting. And if it's not noted before this, it, the significant changes which are then become more chronic adapt and, uh, and occur. The tailor starts becoming a more uh, hourglass shaped and it remains in the Aquinas position to such extent, as you can see on this x-ray, this longitudinal axis is almost as uh, same as the tibia. The calcaneus also remains in an Aquinas position and it can be uh, displaced posteriorly. And it can get to such an extent that only the um, only half of the superior aspect of the uh, talus is actually articulating with the tibia. And when this progresses, the forefoot becomes severely abducted, as you can see in the picture on the left hand side, and the heel can actually not touch the floor once it becomes this, to this level. And this is not purely a bony condition, as I mentioned, there's soft tissue contracture as well, and this can exasperate the condition. Imaging plays a role fairly early on, and uh, the common views used are the forced plantar flexion and forced dorsiflexion lateral views. With the forced plantar flexion views, it shows a persistent dorsal dislocation of the first metatarsal axis to longitudinal axis of the tibia, as you can see on this picture. And the forced dorsiflexion lateral view shows a persistent early dis decreased tibia calcaneal angle. And it should is fairly demonstrated on the picture on the right hand side. And this indicates a fixed hind foot equinus that would need addressing. Now the management, if noted early, and at least uh, hopefully uh, before the, the, child, uh, the child reaches nine months of age, and definitely within before it reaches a year, is restoration of the normal anatomic relationship between the talus, navicular and calcaneus to ensure appropriate weight-bearing axis. There was a, uh, traditionally there was a role of aggressive surgery with soft tissue releases. However, this was associated with a number of uh, complications, including wound necrosis, tailor necrosis, undercorrection, and pseudoarthrosis, as well as stiffness of the joints. So an effort has gone to less, less, less aggressive approaches to try and reduce the risk of these complications and improve long-term outcomes. And this approach involves serial casting, a bit like the Ponsetti technique, where we stretch the contracted dorsal and lateral soft tissues to try and reduce the tail navicular joint. And as, as demonstrated in this picture, you, you put your foot, uh, sorry, you put your um, thumb on the plantar aspect of the tailor head to counter traction, and you try and bring the forefoot over to try and reduce the tail navicular joint. You then place this in a cast. So it's in a club foot type position, but this is what's required to reduce the tail navicular joint. And you do serial casting once a week, sometimes up to five changes until you feel that it's reduced. reduced. At the end of this sequence of casting, you can then need to perform a little procedure whereby you pass a KY across the tail navicular joint to hold it reduced. And you do a tender Achilles tenotomy at the same time to improve the aquinas. Sometimes due to aid with the, um, the passing of the KY across the tenovicular joint, you need to do a small dorsal incision. But once again, this is less aggressive and relatively small compared to the previous surgical interventions. Certainly outcomes of this technique have been good and there's been good long-term results showing improved function and alignment with uh, the serial casting and um, uh, holding a diffusion with a, uh, holding a fusion with a KY. The KY is typically taken out at about four to five weeks. This is done in theatre. It may require a period of casting afterwards just for a short period of time. Okay, we move on to the accessory navicular. Now the accessory navicular is a separate ossification center for the tuberosity of the navicular, as I mentioned, separate to the navicular ossification center. It's present in about five to 10% of the population, and it typically remains asymptomatic. And I think uh, it's probably prevalent slightly higher, but it's only found incidentally. It may exist as a separate ossicle within the um, uh, posterior, tib uh, posterior, uh, posterior tibialis tendon. It may form a synchondrosis with the navicular, or it can, it can in fact fuse the navicular and form a uh, corneate type uh, navicular. 
Now, the, the posterior tibialis tendon may insert into the accessory instead of the navicular tuberosity. And it's thought that this aberrant insertion may uh, cause the, the, an alteration in the pull of the tendon. And this is what may lead to the pes planus deformity forming. It's interesting that the symptoms are more common if a synchondrosis forms rather than if just a normal ossicle forms. And certainly the symptoms tend to progress in adolescence with increasing activity and increasing weight bearing with increased uh, BMI as well. Patients typically complain of pain localized over the prominence of the navicular. They often feel this on the medial side. They also can have pain in the medial arch of the foot. Uh, they need to be wary because they may have posterior tibialis tendonitis or dash tendinopathy. And this may be completely different to the, having the os navicular or an accessory navicular. And therefore you need to differentiate the two before you undergo uh, management surgically for this. Uh, one way of doing this would be with an MRI scan to see if there's any high uptake around the um, um, synchondrosis or whether there's any fluid changes or signal changes as well. Uh, management options initially are non-operative and which require physiotherapy, offloading if required, particularly if they're particularly inflamed and angry, uh, strengthening of their posterior tibialis tendon, and orthotics. And orthotics is uh, important with the operative and non-operative options as well, because this maintains the longitudinal arch and helps to offload the stresses of the posterior tibialis tendon and hopefully prevent progression. The surgical option is the kidney type procedure. And this involves um, a medial incision, an excision of the um, accessory navicular from the uh, tendon, as well as from the bone if the synchondrosis is present. And then advancement of the posterior tibialis tendon um, dorsally as well as uh, distally. And I often do this with suture anchors going into the navicular and we get good results for this. It often requires the patient being in uh, cast for two, two weeks and then a boot for uh, four weeks just to protect the repair. And then you get them going uh, with regards to physiotherapy, strengthening and orthotics to protect them in the long term. Uh, there has been a suggestion of injecting around the accessory navicular as well for pain relief. Certainly, um, I've not done this because I, um, if the MRI suggests the signal changes around uh, the, uh, the accessory navicular, I feel surgical intervention is better as I'm quite hesitant to inject steroids around uh, tendon, particularly giving it, uh, increasing its risk of rupture. Okay, so that was quite a um, run through of um, uh, pediatric flat feet. I think the essentials that we need to take from uh, this is the flexible deformity should, in the majority, remain asymptomatic. Uh, when they are symptomatic, they should do well with non-optimal measures. Uh, if that fails, the small percentage of those that fail would require some joint preserving surgery. I think at the moment, um, the gold standard is a calcaneal osteotomy, which require, which involves um, a triplane correction with a graft as well. And this may be held with a KY or without, depending on how stable it is on table. Uh, Whilst that's true for flexible, rigid deformities is important to identify fairly early. And this is clearly with examination to determine whether it's a rigid subtalar um, movement. And this can be done by offloading the child or by getting them on tiptoes. The rigid deformities also need to be looked at in more detail to see whether it's associated with neuromuscular disorder or genetic disorder, whether it's a coalition or whether it's associated with um, a vertical talus. It's important that all these things are identified fairly early. Once again, treatment should always be non-optive initially, apart from the vertical talus, which has to be quite aggressive uh, serial casting from an early stage once identified. Now we're gonna move on to the lesser toe deformities. Um, the names sort of get intermingled we, we have the hammer toe, claw toe, and mallet toe. And uh, the terminology can be uh, confusing sometimes because it's being used by different healthcare professionals in different ways. The mallet toe tends to be uh, 
uh, flexion deformity isolated to the distal interphalangeal joint, and it's not associated with a hyperextension of the proximal balance. The hammer toe is a flexion of the proximal interphalangeal joint with or without a flexion deformity of the distal interphalangeal joint, but it does tend to have a hyperextension of the proximal phalanx. And with the claw toe, well, you once again have a hyperextension of the proximal phalanx. You have flexion of the proximal interphalanx, and you can have flexion or extension, which creates a boutonniere type deformity of the distal interphalangeal uh, joint. It's important to identify that where is the, 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 the issue. So with the hammer and claw toes, certainly the most of the um, dysfunction is a, a, occurring as a result of uh, something happening at the metatarsal phalangeal joint, whereas with the mallet toe, it tends to be isolated to the distant phalangeal joint. Now, most of these deformities can be put down to uh, constriction of footwear, but this is slightly simplistic. But as you can see from this picture, you can see why this occurs. It may also be idiopathic. It may be trauma related or post-surgical related. And with the hammer and claw toes, it may be associated with a neuromuscular condition or even a compartment syndrome uh, type of scenario. Now with the mallet toe particularly, patients often complain of uh, pressure on the tips of the toe. They may get callus formations on the dorsal surface. And it may be associated with loss of space for the lesser toes due to crowding as a result of a hallux valgus or crossover toes from the other lesser toes. They also may be associated with metatarsalgia. Particularly with um, the claw and the hammer toes, there may be an associated callus formation on the plantar aspect of the lesser toe metatarsal phalangeal joints. Uh, Patients often complain of an inability to get into appropriate shoes, particularly if they're wearing protective shoes because they're working on building sites or need to wear uh, toe cap type shoes for security purposes. And uh, there is an association with uh, infection if they're um, noted to also have diabetes. Now, if we uh, talk particularly about the hammer and the claw toes, we should consider the stability is hinged on the metatarsal phalangeal joint. And, it, and this is a, a good way to think about the management of these deformities as well. We know that the, the extensor mechanism has a central slip which inserts into the base of the middle phalanx and there's two lateral bands which then join and attach to the distal phalanx. And now when you have an um, injury or weakness to uh, the metatarsal phalangeal joint, either due to plantar plate laxity or disruption, you tend to get hyperextension of the metatarsal phalangeal joint. You then develop uh, imbalance between the extrinsics and intrinsics, with the extension digitorum longus driving the metatarsal phalangeal joint into extension. And then you get the flexor digitorum longus driving the proximal phalangeal joint, distal phalangeal joint into flexion. And once the metatarsal phalangeal joint hyperextends, the tendon balance becomes a perpetual cycle and worsens the deformity. There's a small group of people where it may occur with uh, traumatic causes, and you can also develop a boutonniere deformity as you see in the hands as a result of this. Now, the key to management is to determine whether this is a flexible or rigid deformity. Obviously, as I mentioned, it can occur in acute setting, and in acute setting, it requires urgent uh, correction of the tendon injury and uh, also um, correction of any collateral uh, ligament injury and this should hopefully resolve this. Uh, but in a non-traumatic setting, if it's a flexible deformity or it's rigid without significant symptoms, we need to decide whether it's better to manage this with orthotics to protect from uh, colostes, to help bring the toe into appropriate position and whether wearing wider fitting shoes and a higher toe box do alleviate their symptoms and avoid the need for surgery. However, if these options have been tried and they haven't resolved the symptoms, then uh, for the flexible deformity, certainly an option for um, the mallet deformity is a flexor digitorum longus tenotomy to try and allow this to sit in an uh, uh, extended position. And you may wish to hold this with a K-wire across the distal interphalangeal joint for a short period of time. 
If it doesn't correct uh, fully, you may also incorporate a condylectomy just to try and shorten the joint and allow it to correct as well. With the rigid mallet deformities, certainly the, ten, uh, the tendon uh, lengthening won't be a particular benefit. And we're looking at more arthrodesis procedures to order a straight toe to allow it to fit into shoes appropriately and allow normal gait. Uh, the fusion uh, is normally performed through elliptical scission on the dorsum of the distant phalangeal joint, uh, excision of the extensor tendon, a release of the collaterals, a preparation of the joint surfaces on both sides, which you can either do with a saw or nibbler, and then a K-wire to hold it in place. There has been a uh, use of intraosseous devices as well, uh, but the distant phalangeal joint I find is quite tricky, and I find the K-wire tends to do a do, do, do this quite well. Uh, I tend to take the K wire out at three weeks. Results uh, that it in men and men always get a bony union, but you often get a pseudo fusion with fibrous union, and this allows some mild movement, but it maintains it in a satisfactory position. Now, with a hammer toe, it's important to know fully whether there's hyperextension of metastasal phalangeal joint or not. If it's a fully, fully uh, completely flexible deformity, and there's no hyperextension of metastasal phalangeal joint, you can certainly consider a uh, flexor to extend to extensor tendon transfer. And this is often done with incision on the um, plantar uh, aspect to get the um, FDL tendon. And this is split along its um, sulcus. And then uh, um, a medial and lateral limb is brought, in extend, uh, brought to the dorsum of the middle phalanx and stitched together. And then this is a, maybe immobilized with KY or a splint for, for this to uh, um, heal. And then um, it normally holds, is held in a, uh, it maintains its position and has relatively good results. The trick of the, the uh, difficulty of it is to try to get the tendon from flexor to dorsal. And this can be quite difficult, and maintaining that position can be a challenge. Certainly, if it's a um, flexible deformity, but there's also um, hyperextension of the um, metatarsal phalangeal joint. We may need to consider whether something needs to be done for the metatarsal phalangeal joint to uh, reduce its length if it's elongated. And this may be a Viles type osteotomy, which is a distal uh, metatarsal osteotomy, to shorten it and also to move the head into a plantar direction. Or you may consider just a dorsal capsule release and um, uh, extensor tendon lengthening. And this certainly um, can help the toe to sit down as well. And this could be augmented with a flexor to extensor tendon transfer in the flexible uh, deformity. If the PIPJ is a, uh, if the hamato is a rigid um, deformity, certainly you need to consider a PIPJ arthrodesis for this with plus or minus extensor tendon lengthening. Once again, this could be done either with a K wire or with an intraosseous device, and certainly intraosseous device is more forgiving in this area due to the length of the proximal phalanx and uh, intermediate phalanx. Um, once again, I'll do this for a dorsal elliptical incision, and I uh, remove the extensor tendons and do a collateral release as well. Once again, you need to consider whether you need to do something for metatarsal phalangeal joint if there is a hyperextension here as well, and uh, certainly this may be a vase or sort of once again, or just a dorsal capsule release with the extensor tendon lengthening you've already considered. The benefit of the intraosseous uh, device over K-wire is obviously the reduced risk of infection from having a K-wire uh, penetrating the tip of the toe for a period of three to four weeks. Now with the claw toe, certainly um, with the flexible, it's a bit like the hammer toe. You can do a flexor uh, digital longus flexor to the extensor tendon transfer with a lengthening with a, of the extensor tendons, plus or minus um, a dorsal capsule release uh, or a vials or sotomy for the metatarsal phalangeal joint to try and get the hyperextension resolved. However, if there is um, a rigid deformity of the proximal phalangeal joint, certainly we'll be looking at off reducing this doing extensor tendon lengthening and a vial osteotomy to um, shorten it and allow the hypersension to resolve. There has been a suggestion that the, these patients may benefit from an interpositional arthroplasty of their metatarsal phalangeal joint, 
but once again, um, the results of this are conflicting and there's no real long-term results to suggest uh, this has benefit over whiles at this stage, full stop, uh, for, uh, at this stage. The problem with the uh, uh, vials is that the soft tissue incision dorsi can lead to scarring and it can lead to a, um, increased uh, um, mobility of the metatarsal flange joint, which can make the toe dysfunction in some, uh, in some ways, and what we call floppy toe, because the tendons have been lengthened as well, metatarsal have been shortened, so you have less control, and so you, patients do complain of a floating toe with this. And with the soft tissue incision, it can also cause scarring, which leads to a hyperextension type posture once again in the long term due to the scarring. And therefore, the vials also has to be taken into consideration of its complications. And so there is a drive more recently to do uh, MIS type uh, distal metastasal osteotomy, which we, where you radiographically perform the vials with a burr and you don't hold this with any um, metal work and allow this to heal with weight bearing. And this avoids the significant scar tissue and increases um, the mobility of the metatarsal phalangeal joint in the long term because obviously you don't have the deep scar tissue as well. And this is something that we're, um, we've been looking at as well. Um, that was uh, quite a rush to rush through the management. So I'm just going to break it down into we really, for the less toe deformities, you really need to look at uh, where the deformity is happening. And most often, for the hammer and um, claw, so it's important to see whether this is a flexible deformity, where there's elongation of the uh, metatarsals on the medial oblique view, which suggests that you're getting full for overload and therefore causing attrition of the plantar plate, where there's been uh, inflammatory arthritis present, which has led to uh, plantar plate uh, attenuation and uh, capsulitis type picture, or whether it's traumatic. You need to assess whether you can, the toes are sublux or completely dislocated at the metatarsal phalangeal joint as well. You don't need to look at the tendon imbalance to see if you can correct the hammer toe. And if this, um, with the tendon balance, if it progresses, you'll get fat pad uh, migration, and then you get further plantar pressure, and that's why you get the plantar callosities. So it's important to look at the metatarsal phalangeal joint, address this, then you address distally the proximal phalangeal joint. The mallet uh, uh, deformity is a normally an isolated deformity and certainly can be dealt with either one of two ways, which is with a soft tissue correction, which is a flex tenotomy, or with an arthrodesis. And this is slightly simpler to manage. I know that's a lot to take in, and I'll be more than happy for people to get in contact with me with regards to uh, any further questions. I'll be happy to reply by email and get back to you uh, with the answers to any of those questions. Um, also, um, I'd like to acknowledge that a lot of the pictures were taken from man surgery or foot and ankle, so I don't get accused of any plagiarism. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Bal, for a very comprehensive lecture on foot and ankle problems with respect to the FRCS. Just a couple of questions. In a flexible fat, flat foot in a kid who is not responding to your, I mean, conservative measures, and that is affecting the other joints, like what you said, a flexible flat feet affecting the other joints could be a consideration for a surgical intervention. What is a typical age group that you're looking forward for any kind of surgery? And what is the most common surgery that you perform in this particular problem? Yeah, I, I would really be looking for them to be 14 years plus, I would say, because you, 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 they're always developing. As we know, the whole lower limb is changing its alignment from tibial uh, bowing, eversion, eversion, the whole mechanical axis is changing. I think if we do anything too significant too early, it can have an impact on the knees and the hips as well. So you want them to get to a significant um, age before you consider doing anything. And certainly I've, um, I, I tend to do the, um, the procedure which was mentioned there, which is where you do uh, osteotomy just posterior to the um, cocaine cuboid joint. And it's like an opening wedge osteotomy where you put some uh, bug tricortical graft. And I do that because I think you'd be then also able to push the posterior fragment medially. So you don't need to do a double osteotomy. Some people have mentioned in literature doing a double osteotomy where they do a medial heel shift as well as the opening wedge on the lateral side. I think that makes it a bit more difficult when you're doing two level osteotomies in one calcaneum. 
And so I'd rather do the wedge, which allows the sinus tarsi to be elevated as well as lengthening as well. You can sometimes do that with a cuneiform osteotomy as well if you feel you need further correction. But I would be hesitant to do that in anyone under nine years of age. I'd really like them to be over 14 years of age, ideally. So preferably you would do a lateral side osteotomy. That's what you mentioned, right? Yeah. And yeah. at what level? Where is the osteotomy? I, I normally do it about two to three, uh, about two to three centimeters posterior to the calcaneal cuboid joint. Okay. And I tend to do it oblique to the tuberosities. Okay. So it's in the calcaneum, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's always, always doing the calcaneum. Okay, and do you uh, do a minimally invasive method or is it a quite uh, wide open one? No, I, do, I normally do it quite a, wide, wide open. So I want to get a good view and I want to see the grafts put in properly. I want to make sure I haven't penetrated the joints. And so uh, I do a quite a large incision on the lateral side. But I think it's, um, it, the children heal quite well. And because you're bringing the heel, the heel into medial displacement, the tissue is not too tight. Okay, thank you for that. And uh, you mentioned also about the coalitions, right? So which of the coalitions is more forgiving? Means which one responds better to resection? The talocalcaneal or the calcaneal navicular? It's very, uh, that's difficult. I, I haven't, uh, the, the, the calcaneal navicular tend to excise and they tend to do okay with that. They don't get big function, uh, motion improvement, but they tend to get symptom improvement, which is good. The talocalcaneal, I find, it's difficult because you talk about the 50% surface area, but some of the ones I've done with 25%, they still have a lot of pain and discomfort. They may have improved motion, but they have a lot of pain. And so I find, I find, it, I find it harder to get across the tibial cocaineal enough to say I've done it that like they're completely pain-free afterwards. And do they end up in having a triple fusion? Uh, no, because most of them have improved and have discomfort. So as long as you manage that with appropriate footwear, they get back to sport. I certainly I'd say that the ones that I've had to go back and do a triple fusion have normally been about eight, nine years down the line. They haven't been in the early phase of surgery. And the, uh, yeah, and the arthrosis screw that you mentioned is only for flexible flat foot, right? Yeah, only for flexible, because the big issue with that is that it can cause overstuffing as well, which makes it a rigid, it makes the uh, subtate joint rigid. And if you used to put it into a rigid flat foot, it wouldn't do anything. It would just cause more pain because you're elevating something that can't be elevated. So you're being pressure on the soft tissues, which, uh, which has a lot of problems. Going back to the Taylor um, Cocaineal Coalition, um, what was I say? Uh, a lot of them, as I said, they, they, with the improved range of motion, they, they, they feel that they've got better and therefore they manage to hold off a bit longer. And so uh, the triple R for D, since you mentioned, do we do that often? I think the ones you know are going to do bad are the ones that are clearly over 50%. And so you wouldn't consider a coalition, uh, a coalition excision in those. You'd just go for a trip, uh, go for an isolated subtalar, or if it's really rigid, a, um, a triple R for D. But for those, I'll try and do an isolated subtalar possible to preserve the tail in the vicular joint. Thank you, Bal, for that. Uh, just one last question before we wind up uh, the session. The um, the maneuver that you mentioned in the congenital vertical talus, it's called as a reverse sponsity or, or something like that, or Matt no, Dobbs no, no, uh, described it, right? Yeah, it's just a serial casting. It's not reverse sponsity, but it's just a serial casting. I don't know the specific name of it, but it's uh, it, it, it we describe it as sponsity just because it's serial casting, but it's not reverse sponsity. It's, uh, it's just a serial casting mentioned by Dobson, but it's, um, it's very effective and the problem is if you start doing this at nine months and beyond, it becomes very limited. So the key thing is to catch it early. And uh, just to uh, for the interest of our viewers who are primarily fellows and residents, can you once again uh, enumerate the steps involved in, a, I mean, this particular Dobbs technique? The Dobbs, yeah. So it's, it's, it's very much, with, um, you often feel the tailor head on the medial plantar side. So you, you literally put your thumb where you can palpate the head and you're taking the forefoot and you're bringing it in a plantar flexion and inversion, inversion. So you're creating a club foot deformity. And initially you don't feel much as in it, you, you, you reduce it and it holds, but you can't really feel the reduction. But you hold it there, you put it in a cast and in, in the following week, you do the same thing. You take the cast off and then you repeat it. And often it's not to the fourth or fifth cast change. You can actually feel palpably that it's reduced. And it is so you, about you do do yeah. serial raise as well, but you notice a palpable uh, change in the position of the tailor head.
So your thumb is one of, I mean, one of your thumb is always on the head of the talus, right? Yeah. Yeah. So the, the I'd, if it's um, a right foot, I'd have my right thumb on the talus and my left hand on the forefoot, bringing it down. So the, the, the thumbs acting as, acting as a, a counter traction. Okay. No, just uh, because in a lot of other areas, I've observed that people describe this as a reverse ponsity. That's why I wanted to ask you whether yeah. we can technically call it as a reverse ponsity. I think Dobbs technique is something that is accepted, right? Yeah, I think Dobbs technique is the correct word, I'd say. Okay. I'd say, because reverse pon ponsetti can be a bit confusing, especially when you're trying to get the ponsetti -eyed method in your head for the exam. If you then try and convert it to reverse ponsetti, it gets confusing. So if you say Dobbs, I think it's a bit easier. Thank you, Bal. I think that's all the questions that we have for this session, Bal. Fantastic lecture, very, very comprehensive. And I'm sure this lecture is going to be useful for a lot of people all over the world. Thank you so Thank much, you. Bal, for joining in. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for the questions. Bye.